that song has a lot to say about um, what we began speaking in last week. If you go to Psalm 143, we're going to finish that psalm today, but if you remember about the first seven verses of that psalm, David was just kind of pouring his heart out to God. He had come to the end of his rope, so to speak. David was on the run from Saul. Saul was the king. Saul sought to kill David, wanted to put an end to his life and such like that. So David, his men, they were on the run. They were hiding in caves. And Dave, David just poured his heart out. I mean, he just got right down bare bone blunt with God and all, even to the point of saying, I'm at the end of my rope, God. I'm at the end of my rope. I don't know where to go from here. Have you ever gotten like that before? Just gotten to the place to where, you know, the, the old saying, they talk about the light at the end of the tunnel, but there's no light at the end of the tunnel. You just don't know which direction you're going to go. You just don't know you know, what you're going to do from this point forward. But then, as we do look into our scripture there on Psalm 143, you'll see that David in verse 5 remembered. David remembered. In the midst of everything he was struggling with, in the midst of all that he was facing, in the midst of his own mind thinking, wait a minute, I'm supposed to be the king, but he's in the palace and I'm in a cave. I'm supposed to be the king, but he's enjoying the fine things of life, and here I am in this cave, not having any food, not being able to go outside. Something is definitely wrong with this picture. But David remembered, and he started remembering the goodness of God. He started remembering the blessings of God. He started remembering how God had, <coughs> excuse me, had indeed worked in his life. But I guess what, what, what stood out to me in those first, I don't know, five, six verses or so, seven verses, is just how real David was able to become with God. I guess I'm going to get a little irreverent here. And don't get me wrong, I'm not taking away from God's sovereignty. I'm not taking away from who God is in any way, shape, or form. But sometimes I almost think that we approach God like this. We're almost scared to approach him. But yet, if you look at how David approached God, and everything, he was coming, he was approaching somebody, he had, an, he, he had a deep-seated, dig deeper relationship with. That he could go to him and be just as honest, be just as open as he would with anybody else. And you know, this is my opinion. I think that's how God wants us to be. I think God wants us to be able to approach him just, just as we are. Whatever we're feeling, whatever we're going through, whatever we're dealing with, God wants us to approach him that way. Verse 7, matter of fact, David said, God, answer me speedily. Okay, This is how desperate David was. This is how at the end of the rope David was. God, I need an answer, and I need it yesterday. You ever been like that? <laughs> Man, God, come on been too quiet i've asked i pleaded where is it at folks something i want to bring out and i want you to know god is not obligated to our time we understand that matter of fact in isaiah chapter 40 what does the bible say they that what wait on the lord shall renew their strength you see they that wait god is not obligated to our timetable and i want us to understand that sometimes we think god why is it you know what does the bible say you know, that a day is as a what? A thousand years, and a thousand years is a day. God's beyond time, okay? We talk about yesterday, today, tomorrow. If you, that, that's all just one time with God. You know, God's not obligated to our time. And the thing about it, God's time is always right, okay? God's time is always right. So I want us to look, verse 8 through 12, and I want us to look at something here, what, what I call the process. Okay, what I call the process. David had a very deep-seated relationship with God and everything, but you know, the j just the human factor got the best of him. Just got the best of him. He's crying out to God, God, I need an answer. I need something right now. And so we see a process that David's looking at and everything to 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 realize to come to the place, the answer that he is looking 
to, to, to seek from God. So look at verse 8 through 12 for just a moment, then we'll break it down. Notice he says, Cause me to hear thy loving kindness in the morning, for in thee do I trust. Cause me to know the way wherein I should walk, for I lift up my soul unto you. Deliver me, O Lord, from mine enemies. I flee to you to hide me. Teach me to do your will, for you are my God. Your spirit is good. Lead me into the land of uprightness. Quicken me, O Lord, for your name's sake, for thy righteousness' sake. Bring my trouble, my soul out of trouble. And of thy mercy, cut off mine enemies and destroy all them that afflict my soul. Stop. I want you to stop right there. Because I'm going to close with that last part, okay? And I want to tie it up in to that last part of that verse. He says, first of all, cause me to hear. Cause me to hear. Now, how does God speak to us? How does the Bible say he speaks to us? Remember? Still, small voice, okay? Still, small voice. Now, God speaks through his word. He speaks through a song, maybe like what you've seen today. He speaks through the wisdom, through the counsel of a friend. But God speaks to us in that still, small voice. And would you agree with me today that often our days, our society today is noisy? A lot of noise going on, isn't there? You know, we've got noise all around us. Whether we've got a radio on, we've got a TV on, we're driving down the road, we've got the noise of the road, and one thing after another like that. And it's a noisy world we live in. But David is saying here, Lord, I want to hear you. There's too much noise. Folks, there has to be an intentional time that we seek God. There has to be that time if you want to hear God's voice. There has to be that time if you're asking God to, to speak, if you're asking God to answer, then are you taking that intentional time where you can hear God? And folks, the thing about it is, if not intentional, God is not beyond getting our attention. Okay, let me repeat that. If we're not taking intentional time to hear, God is not beyond getting us, getting our attention. My father-in-law was a truck driver, you know, in his earlier days. But, God, but the Lord had called him to preach, and he ran. He kept running from it. He didn't want it. And finally, he got to the place, he said, God, like Paul, he said, if you want me to preach, if you want me to serve you, then you're going to have to knock me off my mule." Well, it wasn't too long after that and everything. God knocked him off his mule. He got his attention and laid him on his back for about two months with back surgery. And during that time, he came to realize, I asked God to knock me off my mule. That truck was my mule. I couldn't drive that truck anymore. God got his attention, you see. God has a way to get our attention, doesn't he? Now, if we're not being intentional, if we're not in that place where we're listening, God has a way. When he wants to get our attention, he knows how to do that. He says, cause me to know or to have understanding. Proverbs chapter 4 tells us to get wisdom and understanding. Proverbs chapter 9 tells us that the knowledge of the holy, the knowledge of God, that is understanding. But if we are not intentionally seeking, if we are not intentionally asking God, speak God, show me, teach me, my friend, we're not going to have that deep, seated relationship that God wants us to have. Folks, listen, the older I get, I don't know how you are and everything, but the older I get, I, for many years, my relationship with God was mediocre. I'll tell you that. I was in the ministry. I was choir director. I was youth director. I was going through all the motions of being, you know, whatever that is. But my relationship was just mediocre. I was reading my Bible, but it was ordered to prepare for a lesson. I was praying, but it was praying for other people and such as that. I was doing, but it was because that was what I was required to do in my position. But as I've gotten older, man, I just want to know God in a greater way. I just want to know what God has for me. You know, even Jesus said, knock. It'll be open seat. You shall find ask. And when I look at that, I see that I see that as Jesus is saying, listen, knock the door down. Knock the door down. So you know what I have for you. Listen. Knock the door down. Folks, listen. 
God wants to do so much more. God wants to do so much. He wants to be so much more in each and every one of our lives and all. But it seems like we're allowing the noise and the busyness and all those things to separate us from that. He goes on to say, deliver me. Deliver me. Deliver me from what? My enemies. I might ask you this morning as you read that text and everything, who would, who would you think David's enemy was? Maybe the first thing you come to is, well, Saul. Saul was after him. Saul was seeking to kill him. Saul wanted to put him out of Saul's misery. Man, I just want to get rid of this guy. You would think, man, that, that, that's David's enemy. But you know what? I don't think David saw Saul as an enemy. I mean, David grew up in Saul's house. David grew up as a dear friend with Saul's son, Jonathan. I don't think he saw Saul as the enemy. I think the enemies that David was talking about was loneliness. Maybe even fear. Maybe even doubt. Maybe even confusion. You know, look at why he's crying out to God. He didn't cry out to God against Saul. He just cried out to God against his enemies, you see. So let me ask you, with that being the case, what are your enemies? What keeps you from pursuing? What keeps you from hungering and thirsting? What keeps you from digging deeper? And, you know, I dealt with the Wednesday night cloud a little bit on on this, and I'll just share it with you, too. Listen, we cannot, we can't use our age as an excuse. You know that? You say, yeah, but preacher, you don't understand. I served in this church for 40 years. I don't care. If you're upright and breathing, you know what? God's got purpose for you. God's got a plan for you. And if you look at Philippians chapter 4, the Bible says, I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. 1 John 4 says, Greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Romans chapter 8, Paul says, We are more than conquerors through him that loved us. On all those things, there was no age barrier. We understand that today. He didn't say, I can do all things through Christ until after 50. He didn't say, Greater is he that is in you than he that is in the world until you pass 60. He didn't say that. There is no age on there, folks. There's no age whatsoever. And then David would go on when he talked about taking shelter. That word, taking shelter, that uh, right, right in there, means to you I flee. God, when it seems that things are pressing about, man, it is you I flee to. Those of you that are parents, you ever remember maybe when, when, when a time came when your kids were scared or something rattled them and everything, and they came and they ran and they ran, grabbed you around the leg? You remember that? You know, maybe a loud noise, something like that. Man, here they come. They want mom and daddy. Why? Because it's a place of safety. It's a place of assurance. You see. And folks, that's exactly the relationship God wants with us. He wants you to be able to to him. He wants you to come to him just as you are, just with what you're going through, because he cares for you. Then he said, teach me. Teach me to do your will. Teach me to do your will. Two things about God's will. I'm not going to get in depth on this this morning, but two things about God's will I want you to understand. Number one is God. what God's will is, is always best for you. Always best for you. And then also, God's will is to bring glory to Him. What God's will is for you is His best, and that we bring honor and glory to Him. That's God's will. That's the way to put it. You know, there are those that are trying to figure out God's will. Oh, what is God's will? Man, it's back there in the cosmos and everything. We'll never understand the magnificence of God's will. I don't know. It's pretty simple to me. God's will is what's best for me and bring honor and glory to Him. Pretty doggone simple when you put it all in context like that. Henry Blackaby, many of you might have read his book. He wrote a book some years ago called Experiencing God. If you've not seen that book, haven't got it, I suggest you get it. I think it's a tremendous book to read. But Henry Blackaby said this, What is God's will for my life is not the best question to ask. He says, rather, I think the right question is simply, What is God's will? The focus needs to be on God and His purpose, not my life. Hey, that's pretty darn good, isn't it? God, what's what's your will for my life? 
Well, it's real simple as far as that goes. Just bring honor and glory to him. We just simply need to be asking, what's God's will? Because it's not about us. It's indeed all about him. Then he says, lead me. Lead me. Lead me in the land of righteousness or right doing. That's what that means, the land of righteousness. It's not a physical place, but it's a place of right doing in our life where Christ is the standard. Romans chapter 12, the Apostle Paul says we're not to be conformed to the image of this world, but we are to be transformed by the renewing of our mind. Okay? Lead me to where my mind is renewed and that I am reflecting you. Folks, I'm talking about getting a little deeper here because I am convinced. And I'm just looking back on my life, okay, and trying to make some comparisons here. I may be wrong in some, some areas. But I'm just looking at that. I, I, I'm convinced and everything that, 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 the, that well, the Christian today has just a mediocre relationship with God. It's just surface. The, 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 we're in a place of comfort. We want to be comfortable here. And I thank God and everything in the relationship he wants us. God wants us to be uncomfortable to the place to where there's no reliance on us. We have to rely totally on that we are looking unto him as the author and finisher of faith. We're not looking under our own abilities. We're not looking under our own strengths. We are looking to him. And when we understand that, then I think that's where we are a light to a culture and a society that is in desperate need of light and desperate need of truth so that they can know they too can have a relationship with God. And then lastly, he says, revive me. I like that. He says to revive me. The word revive just means, you know, brought back to life, to renew, to refresh. Revive me. Lift me up. Why? For your name's sake. It's not about me. But that I would be revived. I would be refreshed. I would be renewed because it's about you and your name. Paul said this. Paul said that I might experience. I want to experience. And here's what he wanted to experience. On one hand, he wanted to know the fellowship of his suffering and the power of his resurrection. I want you to think about that for a moment. You know what Paul was literally saying? I want to know Jesus from A to Z. Let me show you why. The fellowship of his suffering. Was there ever a lower place in Jesus' life than when he went through his trial, rejection, crucifixion, mocking, all that stuff, that was about the lowest from a human standpoint Jesus could get. The lowest. And then the highest, the power of his resurrection. Death could not hold him. At all. But he came forth from the grave, resurrected and everything, so you and I have a hope that there's something beyond this life, that the grave's not the finality of it, but that we will too will be resurrected with Christ. Paul said, I want to know him from A to Z, from what he suffered there on the cross of Calvary to what it was like when he rose up and walked out of that tomb three days later. That's what Paul wanted to experience. Folks, that's where God wants us in our life. That's where he wants us. Revive me. For your name's sake, because you know what, folks? We are his witness. We are his chosen vessel. We are his salt and light. And you know what else we are? We're his soulmate. Say, Pastor, what do you mean we're his soulmate? The Bible says his spirit bears witness with our spirit that we are the children of God. You know what? Soulmate, man. We're his soulmate. That's what he wants. That's what he wants for us. It's not about us, but it's all about him. Now, I told you I'm going to close in verse 12. Look what he says there, the very last part. The last, I guess it is five words, for I am your God. David went circular here. Did you see that? If you go to the first part of 143, David was to the end of his rope. He'd come to the end. He needed answers. He needed something quick from God because he didn't know what was going to come next. And then he remembered and said, okay, God, cause me to hear, cause me to learn, teach me, guide me. David came back 
who is perfect. I am your king. Now let's make that personal. I know Kathy's never had any problems. Her life has been just wonderful. Great over here, okay? But there's probably a time someplace where she came to the end of her rope. You work for the government, that happens. Okay, right, Lee? Yeah. <laughs> so there may be a time she's crying out. But then she remembers. And you know what? The bottom line is, I'm God's witness. I'm God's witness. I'm God's joy. I'm God's valentine. It's him. He may have been. I mean, when you raise boys and everything, you got problems. Okay? And so I'm sure they had struggles. And sometimes thinking, man, I am to the end of my rope. I'm going to see who I can pawn these guys off on. I've, I've had it. I'm done. You know. But then he remembers. And the thing that we've got to remember, every one of us are a servant. Every one of us are a witness. Every one of us are more than conquerors. Every one of us are his valentine. You see? And the bottom line is this. Just how close do you want to get? How close? You want to take God, you want, you want God to take you beyond where you're at? Or you just want God to keep us comfortable? Let's just stay comfortable. Okay? I ain't got much more time on this planet. Let's just stay comfortable. I think Paul was an older man. And when I say older, maybe in his 50s, 60s, I don't know. That's kind of young, you know. He wanted to know. He wanted to know. God kind of took, took us through, me, I guess you could say, a little bit of just remembering this past week. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I heard a thud. I know. I'm up here telling you what God did here. About 3 o'clock in the morning, I heard a thump. You know, something. I'm like, what in the world happened? Jumped up. And Deb and I don't sleep in the same room, kind of thing, because she snores and won't shave her legs. You know, so, no, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Actually, it's I snore and I don't shave my legs. Okay, so, anyhow heard that thump, so I jumped up, I opened the door, said, Deb, did you hear that? Hear what? Sound like somebody falling. I said, I'm on the floor. What in the world? Flip the light on. Yep, she's on the floor on her back with this puddle of blood next to her head. And immediately, I thought, oh my goodness, head, blood, that's not a good thing. And I was doing okay until I went to raise her head. I put my head hand behind there, and when I pulled it back, it was just straight. You know. And I could never be a nurse. I don't usually do that. You know. And so she kept saying, I'm okay, I'm okay. I'm going to try to get her up. Well, then her head started shaking, and her eyes fixed. And that's when I just... Oh no, what, what do I do? What do I do? First thing I thought was 911. So that's what we called. Long story short, we spent most of the early Friday morning in the hospital. Everything got her all taken care of. Everything and everything was okay. But I can tell you one thing, did a lot of praying at that time. Did a lot of praying. God keep us safe on the road. God don't let anything be wrong. And God let her be able to come home. And it's just one of those times that I guess you could say, I hate that it happened, but God kind of got my attention. Do I really trust him? Do I really trust him? It's just like that song that we saw this morning. I'll praise you when everything goes right. Great. I'll praise you when the bills are paid. I'll praise you and everything when I got my... That's not what it said, did it? I'll praise you in the what? Praise you in the storm. I'll praise you when I'm in the cave. I'll praise you when somebody's after me. 
I'll praise you when I don't have anything to turn to. I'll praise you. How? You know why? Because I'm your servant. I'm your servant. David was a king. I'm not a king. Doesn't make any difference. If you're a child of God this morning, you're a servant. Okay? And he's called every one of us to be his light, to be salt, and to bring him honor and glory that people could see Jesus Christ in us. We are his servant by design. We are his servant with purpose. And we are his servant with power through the Holy Spirit of God. We're going to look next at Ephesians chapter 2. I'm going to challenge you to read Ephesians 2, 1 through 10. We're going to spend a couple weeks there. But we're going to tie these two in together, and hopefully at the end of the four weeks, you and I, you and I, will learn who we are in Jesus Christ and who Christ is in us. Would you bow your heads, please? Head bowed and eyes closed. Heads bowed, eyes closed. I guess my question this morning.